Most of you uh, were here last night, so I'll do another short intro. My name is Steve Edelman. I have type 1 diabetes. Hold, okay, we got uh, our trusty AV guy. I've already forgotten his name, because um, I'm normal with names. Uh, okay, how about that? Okay. Welcome, everybody, to our third annual one. How many folks were here last year? Raise your hand. Wow. Alrighty. Louder, louder. Okay. I'm going to get close as I can to this thing, um, and we'll make an adjustment. Um, okay. Well, welcome, everyone, to our third annual one. It's, uh, it's always amazing to me um, how adults with type 1, um, at least chronologically adults, uh, need to spend time together. And uh, we, Jeremy and Tricia and Schaefer and I, um, we were blown away the first year. And then we said, there's no way we can do better than that. And, we, and the same with the second year. And after last night at our ice-breaking activities, that was awesome. And I, hopefully you met some new people that you could hang out with and, and over the weekend and beyond. So I want to uh, also, before I get into some intros, I just wanted to tell you that NASA is very interested in diabetes. And they have all kinds of technologies and they are satelliting in today to listen. Okay, everyone quiet. Houston Discovery, go ahead. Discovery Houston, we've got a good picture of Steve and uh, we're still looking at it. <laughs> Told you. All right, now. Houston Discovery, go ahead. Whoops. Okay, I want to do a quick uh, second intro of Tricia Santos, Jeremy Pettis, Schaefer Bader. Uh, these are all, this is the future generation of endocrinologists, diabetes specialists. They all trained at UCSD. I had the pleasure of being uh, one of their mentors during their training. And now it's very, I'm very proud to say that they are colleagues and peers and they are now uh, training the other future diabetes specialists of America. So I um, want to welcome them, want to thank them for their help. And you're going to see them up here quite a bit during the conference. So thank you very much. I have to say a big thanks to the TCOID team. This is our entire team. We use you know outside vendors for other things, but this is the hardcore team located in San Diego, working hard to put on these programs all around the country. And every single person is here today. And to my left is, no, that's great. Uh, uh, to my left is Michelle Feinstein. You'll, see, you'll hear from her later this morning. And she is our executive director. Uh, that took over for Sandy Bordet. I want to thank our corporate sponsors. I want you to notice the different levels, you know, rage bolus, time and range, uh, and um, Dexcom, Novo Nordis, Insulet. Um, these and all the companies that are supporting us, uh, they are unrestricted educational grants. They don't tell us what to say, how to say it. And if you notice, they're all type one oriented companies. We don't have any, um, you know, uh, snake oil companies selling supplements and things that'll cure diabetes. And um, I think someone started off the cop. Let's, let's, let's give them a, a, a thankful. And uh, you're going to hear from Michelle Feinstein about this, but for every person that comes to this conference, like all of you, it costs uh, TCOID $500. And you know the registration is much less than that. And we have 700 people represented by 45 states, Canada, Denmark, <laughs> United Kingdom. So it is the single biggest conference for people with diabetes. But you know, it, the numbers are one thing. To me, it's the quality. And um, you know what I dawned on me yesterday? What makes this conference so great is, yeah, the speakers are awesome. Many of them have type one, but it's the people who attend. So it's really, we're one, just one big group. Now, I've been, I've been charged with the task of giving you the past, the present, the future in 25 minutes. Uh, I might go over a little bit, Dr. Polonsky knows that, and then we'll shorten the uh, health for a break a little bit to make sure we give you all the information this morning. Okay. Let's talk about the past. <laughs> For those of you that have watched Game of Thrones, you know, there, it was pretty tough times back then. And a lot of times you just didn't make it 
uh, and a few people did. So I know that many of you guys have seen this slide, but I have to start off with the past. You know, before the discovery of insulin, you died. Either ketoacidosis or starvation. And that's how they treated these kids before the discovery of insulin. And even back then, they get the snake oil false promises. You know, this is a remedy for kids with type 1 diabetes. And, you know, the parents were desperate. This is also one, Celicin, only 4 to 12 tablets a day until all your diabetes symptoms disappear. These folks are around today, believe it or not. I got a slide at the very end of my talk as well. So in 1922, uh, you can see this headline, the Toronto doctors are on track for diabetes cure. I want to call out Dr. Ian Bloomer and Dr. Heather Bloomer. They're here from Toronto. They're distant relatives. No, they're not. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but hey. Uh, but uh, Ian Bloomer, who's giving the workshop in the afternoon on all the upgrading, up, the newest stuff in glucagon. He runs the, the best diabetes center, Charles Best, and you'll, you'll see him right on this slide. Best is on the right hand side. He's like an undergraduate and he worked with uh, Frederick Banting uh, to develop and discover insulin. And then of course Marjorie the dog. Uh, what they did was they thought the pancreas had something to do with diabetes. They took out her pancreas, and she started drinking and urinating all over the place. And in the journals from Best, this gentleman over here, um, he noticed the, ur the urine was attracting ants, and it was sweet. He tasted it. And that was the beginning of the discovery of insulin. Here is the here is a paper uh, locally that it, this whole discovery almost got halted because of animal rights. Uh, folks. Now, I love pets. I have a rabbit. I have a cat. I used to have a dog. Uh, the rabbit scared the dog away. And then, um, <laughs> and we see a lot of pets today. I mean, they're just awesome. Uh, and, uh, but I have to say, I hats off to the animals that were sacrificed to discover insulin. To this day, probably the single greatest medical discovery. And here's just a, a blow up of the picture. This is how they depicted Banting and Best and how they treated the dogs. Now, here's Ted Ryder. He's one of the first kids ever to receive insulin. You can see he's age five, 1923. He's scrawny, skinny. He's not very happy. And if I had to wear that goofy outfit, I wouldn't be that happy either. Here's his logbook. You can see the little... Uh, markings around the red, inside the red circles, that's when he received these very crude pancreatic extracts. They pretty much put him in an osterizer. I don't think they had osterizers back then, but they mushed it up. The, he got terrible, huge abscesses because, you know, they tried to make it as sterile as possible. And you can see his sugar in his urine dropped every time he got an injection. Here he is five months later. Same kid. And you're not going to believe this. He lived... 75 years without all the tools we have today. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause. He's, no, he's not over there. Uh, okay, you, you know what's important to all people with diabetes? Having a good partner. And that's, we call those folks type threes. We have a lot of type threes here today. How many type threes are in the room? Raise your hand. Okay. By the way, Bill Polonsky's gonna have a session that's added on uh, for type threes at 1.30 in the foyer if you want to get rid of your partner with diabetes and then bitch about them during the... <laughs> now, that's, that's not his wife. It's his mother. Okay. So they won the Nobel Prize, and you, the headline at the top of their picture says, have they robbed diabetes of its terror? So f four Canadian researchers shared the Nobel Prize, and that was it. Now... I want to fast forward to 1970 when I was diagnosed with type 1. Now, it's not spanky. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's right here. That's me when I was 15. And it's amazing that this is almost 50 years after the discovery of insulin. You know what I was on? The same thing Ted Ryder was on. Urine testing and insulin. That was it. And uh, so it's amazing to me how slow the advancements have been coming. So this is uh, a education sheet that I got when I was 15 at Kaiser Hospital 
in a room of like 48 other very heavy type twos. And I, I, loved, I love this, you know, look what they're recommending, Wonder Bread. I, don't you love it when it gets stuck to the top of your mouth and whole milk, look at that slab of uh, roast beef with all the fat around the outside, canned green beans, and at least they had an apple on there. And, and they mix type one and type two education together. Look at the size of that needle. Oh my God. Now, Dr. Pett is here. You'll hear from him after the, the mid-morning break. You know, he, every time he hears us old timers whine about the old needles, he says, hey Steve, I'm tired of hearing about your bamboo needles. But I wanted, I have this slide for him that there's this, we missed the July sale for bamboo needles, <laughs> but I'm sure we can, I'm sure they'll hit the market again soon. Now, in 1970, I was put on one shot of MPH in a regular day. That was pretty much it. And just to remind all you newbies to diabetes, there were no insulin pumps, there were no insulin pens, there were no analog insulins, the A1C test wasn't here, there was no glucose meters. Of course there was no CGM, there was no phone apps. It's just that urine test get on your right. 10 drops water, five drops urine, you drop a little glucose pill in there. And they also had one for ketones as well. Now, why do I have a, a picture of UCLA? That's where I went to undergrad in the 1970s. And um, they had, I didn't know anybody with diabetes. There was no social media. There was no, you know, type one groups. You were pretty much all by your own. And nowadays things have changed dramatically. And, and there were obviously no conferences uh, for people with type one diabetes as well. Here's an old chart that I took a picture of. Um, and you can see if you have good control, you're okay on the left. And if you have bad control, you're on the right. Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> I mean, I looked at this when I was in college and I said, I saw that cross on the X on the groin area. And I said, so I said, you're damn right, that's important. But then I looked closer and it actually said impotence. <laughs> that's pretty important. Uh, now the other thing is, if you didn't know this, if you have really bad control before puberty, it can stunt your growth. And so we still see that these days, but we just don't see it as much. And that was the past pretty much, but you know, even though I'm kind of separating past, present, future, we have people in this room who are crossing all boundaries. And that's, we don't expect everybody to come here with perfect control. And, and I know, I've met some of you uh, last night, and you're still struggling. Now, Cindy Fina was one of my patients. She was a dental hygienist and a belly dancer. She made the cover of Diabetes Forecast. She organized, at that time, all of our volunteers. Uh, and this is a few months before she passed away from hypoglycemia. Super tight control her whole life tons of hypoglycemic reactions, unconscious ones, and she was found, uh, 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 someone called from work, she didn't show up, and she was in her apartment, and this happens much less today, uh, thanks to CGM and other features, but the longer you have diabetes, the less well you are to recognize your lows, um, but it, this still happens today. So it's, uh, I think one of the things that I'd love to be in the permanent past are these type of situations. They don't happen very often, but obviously they're, they're pretty dramatic. Now, the past, you know, I put glucose meters in the past because, you know, now we have CGMs that you don't have to calibrate. Not all of them are like that, but eventually we're working that way, and we're all gonna need glucose meters for at least some point in time, you know, whether you're on a CGM that doesn't need to calibrate or not, and it's really one of the most important tools we have, and that was a tremendous advance in the early 1980s. And what always bugged me, you recognize some of these old meters, um, is that why on these advertisements are the numbers always so normal? <laughs> you know, I dare these pump companies to come up with ads that look like that, or when you get above 200, the little voice box says, son of a, <laughs> or damn. And I think I'd love to hear, like, music come out. Honey, you are my candy girl. I think they'd sell more pumps if they just put high numbers there. There's the first insulin pump. 
Seriously, this guy's from Los Angeles. He has type one. Uh, you don't see the plug that's into the wall. He can't walk very far. Uh, <laughs> the batteries didn't last that long, but uh, kudos to him. Uh, you know, you gotta start somewhere. Um, and basically, this is the way to control your diabetes. It's to stand perfectly still and do not eat a thing. If your basal rate is set perfectly, you should be fine. Okay, present. For those of you that saw Breaking Bad, you know, why'd I pick the present? Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of good things about that show. There's a lot of bad guys, a lot of good guys, but it brings you closer to where we are today. And where are we today? We're basically, diabetes is still Bitch, bitch, little bitch. I made you my bitch, Jesse. Bitch, bitch. Yeah, bitch, Jesse. Bitch. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I love talking to adults. You know. Um, I mean, this is the state of the art. We're going to hear from Kelly uh, tomorrow about the T1D exchange and all the data they're collecting. But if you notice the percent of people with type 1 in the United States that go to pretty premier type 1 centers, uh, this is the percent of people with an A1C less than 7. Now, if you look at the younger group, less than 13, they have the highest rates. Why? Because they're cheating. They raise the goal for that group. Now, you look at teenagers. That's a whole other species of the, and you can see that only 25%, but their goal is less than 7.5. Now you look at young people, 20 to 26, and only 20% are reaching a goal less than seven. How many folks here are in this age category? Raise your hand for us. 20 to, tw 20 to 26. Yeah, we got a couple over there. We have, I want to welcome all the all the college kids from Children with Diabetes. Uh, we invited them to come, and they're from all over the country. So the bottom line is, um, it's tough to get your A1C to go. And these are the folks that go to the premier centers, CGM, pumps, diabetologists. So, you know, what, what does the A1C really mean to all of us this weekend? Absolutely nothing. What is more important than the A1C? I'm going to show you a short video clip of the Edelman Report, and there's a whole bunch on our website, uh, also done with uh, Jeremy Pettis, Tricia Santos, Schaefer Bader. Hello, nation. Today, we're going to talk about why the A1C sucks and why time and range is so important. Now, I've also learned from the younger folks that if you want to be cool, you look up things in the Urban Dictionary. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, and uh, I typed in time and range, and it couldn't come up with anything. Uh, it had a couple other things that were close to that, but not, not clean enough to show at this conference even. <laughs> so what is time and range? You're going to hear a ton about time and range. Our session on Sunday morning with Tricia Santos and Jeremy and Schaefer, uh, gonna talk about how to stay in range. Thank all of you for sending in your CGM downloads, especially the ones that were absolutely perfect. Uh, and, and time and range has a specific definition. It's the percent of time that your numbers are between 70 and 180. And then of course, we're gonna talk more about that and probably every, almost every speaker here, almost, going to be talking about time and range. Now, what are the unmet needs in type 1 in, the, in 2019? Well, unpredictable glucose swings is what we deal with all day long. Not enough time and range. I was comparing my time and range to Aaron Kowalski, who will be speaking right after the break. Ah, I was 10% higher than him. Reaching an A1C goal without hypoglycemia. Preventing and controlling weight gain, that's, that's an issue uh, for us adults with type 1. And reducing our risk for heart disease. Heart disease is common in type 2. It... There we go. God, slow. Thank you. Um, 
the the time and the heart disease is not only important in type two diabetes, but it's also important in type one. I think I met three or four folks last night that had cardiac bypass surgery, so we all have to pay attention to that. And of course, the emotional burden of living with type one. That's why I invite my good friend and colleague Bill Polonsky, who's speaking immediately uh, after myself. Now, I want to spend a few seconds on CGM. Um, it is the most important advance for people with type 1 diabetes since the discovery of insulin. That's my, that's my thought. More important than any other advance you can, you can tell me. If I had to go back on MPH and regular in order to keep my CGM, I would do it. Because I could do a much better job uh, if I have my blood sugar every five minutes knowing the trends, where it's coming from, where it's going. So. When I, when I talk to people who don't know much about type 1 diabetes, I just show them this picture. This is type 1 diabetes. And you know what? I think all of us in this room, we get frustrated, the unpredictable nature. You have unexpected highs, unexpected lows. I got low last night in the middle of the night. I have no idea why. I only bullish four times in an hour, but for that high after dinner, but no. Uh, <laughs> You know, these insulin carb ratios, correction factors, they're artificial calculations. We know that it's the best we have. Uh, and of course, then there's exercise. Someone with type 2, they can exercise all day long, they're always going to be better. And they hardly ever get low. For us, if you exercise, that's going to mess up your diabetes unless you manage it. Now, Dexcom uh, is here and we have four CGM companies. Dexcom now has the G6, goes to the Apple Watch, goes to the phone, goes to the monitor. Um, you don't have to prick your finger uh, if you don't want to. It comes factory calibrated, approved by Medicare, and then they have a very cool app, the Clarity app. Now, we better call our AV guy. So um, let's see if we got this. There we go. Um, Okay, let's see. Gosh, challenges. Um, so then the Eversense, it's the newest on the block. It's just, it's a different uh, model of way of doing it. You have an implantable CGM, uh, implantable sensor. You wear this transmitter over the arm over where you implanted the sensor, has on-body alerts, and there's no monitor to it. You, you, it goes directly to your iPhone. And it can go to the Android, it can go to the iPhone, go to the Apple Watch, and what the Dexcom and the Eversense has is they have sharing in real time. So I love the fact that, look at these blood sugars of these people being followed. You know, <laughs> that's crazy. Um, now, there's a special etiquette for all you type threes about sharing when your loved ones share their numbers with you. And that's why Dr. Polonsky is so involved in diabetes, and he's in this short video clip with me. Meters these days are going to the cloud. Oh, whoops. Looks like I'm getting a little low. It's so nice to catch these things early. Um, let's get some juice. Oh, whoops, wrong bottle. Let's, Martinelli's apple juice. Oh my, my God, favorite. Steve, I just got the alert. You're low, you're low, my God. I brought you a Diet Coke. I know you'll need that, and insulin, and here's some glucose tabs, and I can get you some more stuff, but come on! You're low! Come on! He, okay, that's Bill. Now, let's go, to, uh, let's go to Jeremy. Jeremy shares my numbers. I was having a bad day. He, my code name is Nargleman. He texted me the picture from his phone, and he sent me a little text. That's what I call real support, Jeremy. <laughs> now, um, then we have the Freestyle Libre Flash, uh, a really incredible device. Uh, some of you are using it. Uh, we call it intermittent sensing, but it, it measures your blood sugar every five minutes. It sucks all the numbers in over the previous eight hours. You have trend arrows, and you don't have to calibrate as well. And as I understand it, the Libre 2 is coming out. Well, they will have alerts. Uh, not in the Libre one. So all four of the sensor companies are out in the exhibit hall, and I'm not here to tell you the details of each one. You gotta find the one that works best for you. And then there's the Medtronic Standalone Guardian Connect. It does have some nice features to it. Um, it is a sick day wear. You still have to calibrate, uh, and they don't have the non-adjunctive claim yet, which means that you're, you're supposed to test before you give insulin, but they're getting there. Um, 
Now, what about therapy, multiple daily injection? Um, we have incredible advances in fast acting, including faster acting Aspart and Afreza, and I think very importantly, the new two basal insulins, to JO and Traceba. I, I think most diabetes specialists feel that these two basils are much better than the older Lantus and the Levomir because they're truly 24-hour insulins. And the reason I'm emphasizing this, for those of you uh, that are on MDI, uh, you should think about that. Now, I don't know if you know this, <clears throat> but in the United States, 75% of people are on multiple daily injections, and, and for many, it works perfectly well. So, you know, I know a lot of people feel, oh, I'm not on a pump. You don't have to explain why you're not on a pump. A lot of people like being untethered. Now, we also have smart pens. This is a, a pen called the InPen from Companion Medical. They are in the health fair as well. It's an it's a unbelievable software. It has all the software programs you get from a pump, and even more. It sucks in the CGM data, the blood glucose meter. Come, you can print out a really summary sheet for your doctor and for yourself. It keeps track of all your doses, so you can find out more about that. So here's a Frezza. All I'm going to say is wrap it on, wrap it off. It, it really meets an unmet need uh, for people with type 1. Better postprandials, less delayed hypoglycemia. Now, I want to show you a video that Jeremy took on a Southwest Airlines flight from San Francisco to San Diego. And this is before the legalization of marijuana. I don't know what the, the rules are when you're up over the air, but you're still in the boundaries of California. <laughs> Just a quick slide to show you about faster acting aspart. It's obviously a liquid. You can put it in a pump. This is a study with pumps, uh, regular aspart, and down below here is faster acting aspart. So it's, an, it's another advance in the rapid on, rapid off insulin. I'm not going to talk about all the different pumps, but we know that the Animus was discontinued. Some of you are still using your old Animus pump. We have the Tandem X2. There, we got some diehards over there. Uh, Medtronic, the, the older 530 and the newer 670G, and then the Omnipod with the newer Dash controller. Now, this is just an example of the sensor-based technology. The Tandem X2 has the basal IQ. It, it communicates with the Dexcom G6. If it predicts you're going to get low, it turns off your pump or suspends your insulin. And when it, it looks at the rate of change, and when it starts to go up, it turns your pump back on. What does that do? Reduces your lows, improves your time and range. Um, and uh, Aaron Kowalski will be talking about the future AP systems and the control IQ, which is the next step. The Medtronic 670G, I'm not going to go through all the details on the slide, but it's, it's an FDA-approved hybrid closed loop. It's a basal rate modulator. Katie DeSimone has her workshop this afternoon on these do-it-yourself systems as well. Uh, and it's, um, it's a system that does take a little bit of work. You've got to calibrate more often to keep it in auto mode. But for people uh, who learn how to use the system, they do quite well. Now, there's do-it-yourself looping. And there we go. How many loopers we have in the room here? Raise your hand. OK, a bunch of you guys. Um, and this is, for, you're going to learn more about it later, but this is an off-label non-FDA approved where you download the app. You can do it with an old Medtronic pump that's hackable, and you can do it with a, the older Omnipod now. And it's basically uh, a basal rate modulator, <clears throat> and it's always in auto mode, which is nice. And since it uses the G6, you don't have to calibrate. Now, I hate people that brag about their time and range, uh, but uh, this is the first week that I was on it. I'm not doing that well now, but I call it LLC, looping low carbs. Um, and it's a way to improve your time and range. So it's something that all of you who are not looping, whether you're on a pump or not, should look into it. It may be for you and it may not be for you. So it turns out that um, it, you know whether you're talking about sensor augmented pumps or with the newer features or multiple daily injections using a smart pen, it really comes down to personal choice. That's it right there, and our choices are increasing. Look at, look at the folks today. 
Phil Sutherland with Team Type 1, all of those riders are, have Type 1 diabetes. Can you imagine being on a bike for five to eight, six hours managing your Type 1? Brandon Morrow, I don't think he's on the Padres anymore. He's a professional baseball player. Of course, we all know Charlie, Ch Charlie Kimball, professional race car driver. He has a, wears a Dexcom, and the, the doctor in the pit crew knows his blood sugars every five minutes. He has uh, tubes in his mouth, one for Gatorade with sugar, the other for water. I don't think he's ever had a problem during the Indy 500. Now, I learned that Robin Arzon, you know, she's a Peloton instructor, and she wears an Omnipod. And then, of course, Chris Freeman. Look where he wears his Omnipod. And look at, uh, he got his, his Dexcom down there. I don't know if you know Chris Freeman, you know, a very famous Olympic cross-country skier. He refused to wear CGM, one of those stubborn SOBs. I don't need it. He got low during the Olympics, he got disoriented, went off the course and got disoriented. Now he's a spokesperson for Dexcom. Now, look at, look at those abs. <laughs> you wanna see mine? You don't know what's under this shirt. Um, okay, let's talk about the future. So I thought of Westworld, but you know what? Westworld is dark. So I'm gonna go back and talk about the future with the Jetsons. <laughs> and I don't think this picture is that far away. They got guys flying around. Uh, now, I'm not gonna spend too much time, so I'm gonna be done in just a few minutes. Um, what about the autoimmune condition that causes type one? What, what causes this? We have no clue. I mean, we, we can talk about killer T cells and the, the islet cells and the beta cells being destroyed, but we really do not have a clue uh, what causes this autoimmune reaction that specifically knocks out the insulin-producing cells um, of the pancreas. Now, being a positive person that I am, I'm thinking that, gosh, it could have knocked out my alpha cells, my delta cells, you know, and I'd have to take digestive enzymes the rest of my life. Hey, just one type of cell. Just happened to be insulin, but one of these days, uh, we're gonna have a cure. Uh, what's gonna bridge the gap until there's a cure? Artificial pancreas. Now, I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, teplizumab, is a anti-CD3 monoclonal antibody. How's that? Basically, it's a drug that dampens the immune system in people that have shown to have the antibodies that will develop type one. These are folks that already had elevated blood sugars. They entered the trial net program uh, and they got this drug compared to placebo and they delayed the onset for two years. Now, think about that. Is that, that's not a cure, but as Dr. Pettis said in his most recent writings, hey, we, we gotta, you can't go from nothing to a cure. It's baby steps. But think about all the developments that are happening every year. If you could have a loved one del delayed for two years, it's everything. Back in 1970, yeah, they had better urine testers. That's about it. Now, TrialNet is a government organization that organizes free screening and uh, organizes many of the studies for type one. They're out in the exhibit hall. You can get your blood drawn, not here, but you can find a place close to you. And someone said to me yesterday, they have a good joke for me, and they said, watch the number of people uh, screening for a trial net is gonna go up dramatically in nine months. So I guess, I guess it wasn't that funny. Uh, <laughs> all right, wasn't my joke, how's that? Um, now, in, in the year 2019, Look at, I just got this from uh, an email. Um, stem cell clinics are popping up around the country to suck your money and throw it away. There's no stem cell uh, success for pancreas and for diabetes. So just be careful. Um, all the false claims you see on vitamins, it's good for this, for your blood sugar, so much of that is just total BS and it really bugs me. Um, what about other therapies? You know, let me, you know, we have pramlantide. That's an old medication currently approved for type one. It didn't come in the best formulation, but companies like Xeris, Adosha, uh, uh, are putting insulin together 
with pramlatide and knowing and making it uh, more therapeutically, I'd say, ad advantageous for folks with type 1. Pe some people are using the GLP-1 receptor agonist, that's off-label, and a big area is the SGLT2 inhibitors, huge area. Two of them have already been approved in Europe. Uh, two of them have been put on hold in the United States. Jeremy uh, Pettis is going to talk about this uh, on, right in this room on Sunday morning. And then, of course, there is glucagon, rescue glucagon. Xeris has an injectable pen, not approved yet. Lily just got their nasal glucagon approved. Then there's going to be mini-dose glucagon. Instead of that hot fudge Sunday when you get low, you're just going to dial a couple units of glucagon, and uh, they're going to develop stable glucagon for bihormonal AP systems. And another whole area of very interesting research is glucagon receptor antagonists. So glucagon uh, is coming back, and it's going to help all of us folks with type 1. So when we talk about closing the loop, we have everything on this slide except on the right. We don't have a fully functional closed loop system where you can eat anything you want at any time, exercise, not exercise, and never have to think about your diabetes. I'm going to leave that up to Dr. Kowalski. And you can see all the different companies working on the artificial pancreas. So it's a race to the finish line, and that's, that's good for all of us. Competition is really good. So, so I'm going to finish up with um, a video of what type 1 is going to be like in 2026. Okay, there we go. Let me do it again. You, you can't miss this video. Oh my God, that What's is going you. On? How are you? How are you been? You look like you have not aged a day. Thank you. You look amazing, but do you, you work here? Yeah, yeah. I'm grateful I got the job at Starbucks, you know, cleaning tables. But what happened was, after the artificial pancreas was developed and got out to most people, patients stopped coming in the clinic. They didn't need me. No education. They didn't, I didn't have to adjust anything for them. And the university said, sorry, you're fired. Yeah. You know... I'm dealing with the same kind of thing. A couple years ago, UCSD gave me the boot, said we don't need you anymore. You know, after Ed Damiano developed that artificial pancreas, he really screwed us. That son of a bitch. But, well, what are you doing now? Well, I got a job at Supercuts. Oh, you're cutting hair. Well, not yet. Maybe next year if I do a really, really good job. I'm, I'm hopeful. So, uh, in conclusion... Uh I want you to enjoy the weekend, soak up the information, make new friends, and if you're not a type one, you're a loser. <laughs> Thank you very much. Come on up, Bill. <laughs>